it, it feels like this conversation about e-campaigning has been kind of going for a couple of years. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, who gets emails from 38 Degrees? Who opens emails from 38 Degrees? <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> me too, if it really speaks to me. If I have to vote in another NHS thing. Um, but, so it feels like we're kind of over this honeymoon period, right? I used to work for 38 Degrees. I love you, Dilly. But, um, it, it, we're kind of realising that actually it's not, you know, it's not going to solve all our problems. Uh, really, it's what we know about strategy applies online just as much as it's offline. So, in that context, uh, I just thought I'd, I'd share a few things. Um, who feels they have a clear strategy in what they're trying to do in their campaign? Clear strategy. Come on, people! <laughs> organisation or small organisation. You can have a clear strategy, but getting your clear strategy adopted. Ah, okay, so good, <laughs> good point. <laughs> Who feels their organisation and which within which they work has a clear strategy? Yeah? Okay, I've got two examples. I'm just gonna try uh, try one of them. Uh, can you share what your organisational strategy is? Um basically um, better rights for, for workers and Public services. Uh, I work for Unison uh, Bolton Council. Cool. And how how is the organisation helping to get that? I'll be honest, I don't know. I'm not so brand new. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's really the question. That, that what what is the strategy? Well, it's like how how are we going to achieve that? Um, so I think. One thing that I really, really want to stress is we use this word a lot, and I work in an organisation, so I work in a, a project called Common Cause, and there's a couple of handbooks here. Um, I, I'm not actually going to talk so much about this, because it's a whole kind of psychological, social evidence space about why we should talk about values, but I'm in a room with people who get that, so I don't need to explain that to you. It's surprising how many NGO staff do need it, though, so feel free to come pick up one of these later. Um, but I thought I'd share a couple of models with you, um, which I found really helpful when thinking through what I'm trying to do. Um, and, dun dun dun, here it is. It's a beautiful kind of half circle. Um, and it's a really useful model, I think, when you're trying to think, okay, so I've figured out who's my target, what's my issue, who's my target, what power do I have over them, etc., etc., etc. So, my audience, who, who am I talking to? The amount of times you will see people write, my audience is the government and then the general public. Is that, is that audience specification? No. Who in the government? Is it the person who's writing the manifesto? Is it the special advisor to the minister who's making the decision at cabinet? Is it the MP? You know, I want one name. That's the target. One name. And then when you're talking about the public, again, the public is not a target. You need to figure out, I want women in social brackets A to B uh, who live in urban areas. Or I want something as specific as possible. Sometimes you can't do that and that's fine. Or I want students who are in their first year at university because they've got more time, who care about uh, international development issues. Uh, so as much detail as you can have. And when you, this, is a, this is a nice kind of little semicircle which helps map out the people that we're working with or against. So just to take you through, we've got people who actively support our campaign. This might be organisational members, allies from other organisations who we've worked with in the past, people who if I call up and say, we've got a demo on Saturday, or can you play, please email your MP, we'll go and do it. We've got passive supports, people who agree with us, people who might hear our message, but who aren't necessarily uh, taking action. We've got neutral people who are probably completely unaware of, of what we're doing. We've got passive opposition, so maybe kind of uh, I was going to say your mum, but I'd say she's more of a passive supporter, probably. Um, oh, do you know, any, any hour of any day, she could go from could change. active supporter down to uh, hostile. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, not, not Becky's mum then, but let's say, <laughs> I'm just trying to think what's a good example. So, someone who knows about the issue, has real, uh, you know, d doesn't think it makes sense, uh, but isn't really going to do something about it. They'll probably argue against it in the pub, it might be your mates. Um, you know, some friends of mine in, who work in uh, the banking sector, for example, when I worked on the Robin Hood campaign, that was all good. Um, and active opposition. So this is your Taxpayers' Alliance. This is people who are actively working against you, trying to, trying to scupper your plans. Who are you going to focus on? Anyone? To go and build support for your campaign. Who are you going to focus on? Passive support. Passive supporters. What are you going to try and get them to do? 
we go active. Right, so you want them to come from here to there? No. Right. You guys are good. What you were supposed to say was, focus on these guys, don't. As Oprah would say, who is my new inspiration, <laughs> what you resist persists. She is a wise woman. And don't focus on these people, because the more that you work against them, the stronger their voice is. So when we're talking about frames, this is what, we're, this is what happens. So for example, you know, that, this whole idea of, do we want to use language like um, public money or taxpayers' money? Public money suggests that we all have put something in the pot, it's ours to share, what, what do we need to spend it on? Taxpayers' money says, this is my money and I don't want to spend it on disability or mental health care because actually I'm not disabled or have mental health problems. So when, when you start to use their language, when you start to engage with their issues or their questions or their press releases, often we just end up supporting what they're doing. So, and why wouldn't we, well, see these people are doing here. There, there is an important job in doing this, let me not undermine that. We, we want to get these people who agree with us doing stuff. But this is, this is the key kind of, if we're looking at Tim's three bits of power, this is this ideas uh, pillar. Is that fair, Tim? So we're really kind of undercutting that. So I just wanted to share that model as something which, which can help you think through who am I trying to work with. Um, yeah, that'd be good. Thank you, Becky. Um, just on who writes emails to supporters, because this might or not, not be relevant. A couple of people. Okay, so I just want to share two things that we, you know, when we write 38 degrees, what we write. Um, what we have to put into every email. You need a reader-focused theory of change. So we've all heard the phrase, I hope, theory of change. What's the impact chain which gets us from where we are to making sure that employees have uh, you know, uh, the pensions that were promised to them, that we have uh, environmental laws which protect um, uh, natural resources for the future? I'm going to come on to that, but it's a, it's a little teaser for you there. But keep looking at me. Um, the reader-focused theory of change is the story that you're telling to the person who's going to open that email, which makes them feel part of the solution. So it's not just a theory of change which says, um, we are going to convince the government uh, with our fantastic policy proposals that this is the way to go. For, for me as a reader, I'm like, great, good for you, see you later. Doesn't involve me at all. So you want something which needs me to take part for that, the for that theory of change to work. So always have a reader-focused theory of change. And then this is an awful American phrase, and I'm kind of over America, but uh, crisis-tunity, which is essentially what's the crisis, what's the opportunity. So that has that kind of urgency. Um, I know, people stop laughing, please. I know it's embarrassing. But um, and it's, uh, I think it's a Mandarin word. Crisis and opportunity is actually the same word in Mandarin. So there's a fascinating fact. But just when you're writing emails, try and keep those two things in your head. Um, so, uh, the next thing, yeah, can the other one first? Yeah, I just really like this phrase. The strategy is turning the resources you have into the power you need to win the change you want. Strategy is turning the resources you already have into the power you need to win the change you want. Or said another way, strategy is what we do today, which changes what we're able to do tomorrow. So often you can't immediately do what you want to do, but what are the building blocks? What's the impact chain? Um, and I just thought, if you can go to the next one, thank you so much, Becky. This is something which we come across all the time. Who has people that they talk to who feel uh, apathetic? Yeah, I mean, apathy, inertia, people who, who are just like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I know, I know it's important, but um, telly's on tonight. Uh, fear, people who are afraid. This is really scary. I, I don't want to do it. I might get hurt. It might mean repercussions on whatever. Isolation, people who feel that they're on their own. There's no one out there who cares. Feeling very... Um, and it's lovely to see what Twitter has done, actually, for that. Particularly, did anyone see the Spartacus report? So this was a really powerful um, use of social media, which was put together. It was amazing what they'd done. Very small group, no more than 10 of people, uh, disabled people, who were often uh, unable to leave their homes on their own, had researched, uh, had written a whole report and built huge social media uh, backing behind it uh, And because they'd found each other online. A lot of them hadn't met in person ever, but so they'd overcome this idea of isolation. But it, but it is an issue for a lot of people. And self-doubt, people who don't think they're able to be part of the change that they want to see. And this is a lovely little model which comes from the New Organising Institute. Again, it's American, and I apologise for that. But they are really good at what they do. Um, and essentially, they have a host of resources, the New Organising Institute, 
a host of resources which are really useful for training if you want to use them. Yeah. And they've, they've got guides on how to lead trainings and everything, so it's got everything you need on there. But this is just a really nice model that I use quite a lot, taking people from stagnation to motivation. Hey, hey, hey. Um, but how do we get from inertia to urgency? How do we get from apathy to anger, fear to hope, isolation to solidarity, and self-doubt to ikmat, which stands for you can make a difference? And what really is, is the most powerful is helping people connect to their own values, which already are all there. And it's often, the way we do that, we access those kind of emotions is through stories. So Becky was talking about picking the right issue, but if I just come in here and talk about uh, something obscure, someone name me something obscure. Uh, Aussie red slippers. Sorry? Aussie red slippers. Okay, that's, that's not a, that's a campaign issue, sorry. Oh, it's it's obscure. Obscure. It is obscure. <laughs> it's, it was good. Sorry, that was my... Let's ban. Let, let's do it. Let's ban, what was it, red fuzzy slippers? Sure, yes. Yeah. Who cares about banning red fuzzy slippers? Not many of you. But if I say, um, when I was very young, uh, I grew up in a house with, with, uh, with central heating and it was wonderful. And then one day, uh, the heating was turned off, we couldn't pay the bills anymore, because um, my, uh, my dad had gone to prison, we'd lost the main breadwinner in the family, um, and uh, I had to wear f fuzzy red slippers. <laughs> and it was, it was really difficult for me. Anyway, you get where I'm going. <laughs> Essentially, I'm hoping you'll now join me in the fight to end red fuzzy slippers. But you are, people don't connect with issues, right? They connect with people. We're social creatures, and the way that we connect... I'm just realising I'm standing in front of this camera. That was not a good idea. Um, the way that people connect with other people is through a shared set of values, and the way we do that is through stories. So what the most successful emails are the ones which tell a story. So they have kind of this personal story in there, they have this reader-focused theory of change, and they have this idea of a crisis and of an opportunity. And really that applies whether it's in an email or whether it's in a face-to-face -face conversation. That's how we do it. So, Derek, I know it's kind of awkward for us. How am I doing on time, Tim? You're over. I'm over. I'm going to stop. I know it's sometimes awkward for us to talk about our feelings, but if we want to build social movements, we have to be much more willing to share our own stories.